Adhikarna 11. Soul's Journey During the Sun's Southern Course. Sutra 20. Atashchayane Pidakshine Atahacha. For the same reason, Api, even when dying. Dakshine Ayane. During the southern course of the sun. The soul gets the fruits of knowledge. Translation For the very same reason, the soul gets the result of knowledge even when departing during the sun's southern course. Just because of this, because there is no need for waiting, because the result of knowledge is not uncertain, and because the time of death is unpredictable, if a man of knowledge should die during the southward course of the sun, he will get the result of his knowledge all the same. By this aphorism, the aphorist demolishes the misconception about the necessity of waiting till the sun starts northward that may arise from the facts that the sanctity of the northern course is well recognized, that Bhishma is known to have waited for it, and that the Upanishad says, from the bright fortnight he goes to the six months during which the sun moves northward. Chandogya 4, 15, 5. The well-known sanctity is a fact in relation to the men of ignorance. As for Bhishma's waiting for departure during the northern course, it was by way of showing respect to popular sentiment and demonstrating the validity of his father's boon that his death would be at his own command. As for the meaning of the Upanishadic text, it will be explained under the aphorism, These are deities conducting the soul, for there are indicatory marks to that effect. Brahma Sutra 4.3.4 Opponent In the Smriti, the start is made with the verse, Now I shall tell thee, O thou mightiest of the Bharatas, of the time traveling in which the yogins return and again of that taking which they do not return. Gita 8.23 And then the special times like day, calculated to lead to cessation from rebirth, are defined in the main. So how can a man departing at night or during the southern course of the sun be freed from rebirth? Vedantin As to that, the answer is Sutra 21. Yogina praticha smaryate smarte chaite cha and these times, etc. Smaryate are mentioned in the Smriti. Yoginaha prati for the yogins cha and ete these two sankhya and yoga paths are smarte mentioned in the Smriti, and not the Vedas. Translation And these times, etc., are mentioned in the Smriti for the yogins, and these paths of Sankhya and Yoga are mentioned in the Smritis and not the Vedas. These limitations of time, etc., as leading to the cessation of rebirth, are mentioned in the Smritis for the yogins, these paths of yoga and sankhya belong to the smritis and not to the Vedas. Thus, owing to a difference of the subject matters and the special qualifications of the people following them, the fixation of time found in the smritis is not to be applied to the Upanishadic context. Opponent The paths of the gods and the mains, just as they are presented in the Upanishads, can be recognized as recounted in the Smritis as well. Fire, flame, daytime, the bright fortnight, the six months of the northern passage of the sun. Smoke, nighttime, the dark fortnight, the six months of the southern passage of the sun. 
Gita 8, 24, 25. Vedantin. The answer is that since a promise about the time is made thus in the Smriti, I shall tell thee of the time. Gita 8.23. Therefore the aphorist apprehends a contradiction and so shows how that can be resolved. In reality, there will be no contradiction in the Smriti as well, if there too the gods conducting the souls are meant by those terms, as they are in fact in the Upanishads. Namaste. What people don't understand about the Vedas in general is that there are two paths given in the Vedas broadly. Huh? <clears throat> but these can be recognized as the Vedic scriptures, meaning the four Vedas, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, and the Upanishads as we went over in this video on the structure of the Vedic literature. Then the other path is given in the Puranas and associated literature, such as the Manu Shastras and Tantras and so on. And what are these two? The path of action and the path of knowledge, Jnana. It's not a good translation of jnana. Jnana, it means realized knowledge, not book knowledge. I would like to call it the path of consciousness, but most people wouldn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so anyway, there are these two paths, the path of action and the path of knowledge. And these are roughly analogous to the paths of karma yoga and bhakti yoga being the path of action, and the paths of Raja Yoga and Jnana Yoga being the path of knowledge. So people don't appreciate this and they think like it's all one or something. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Because the destination of those who follow the path of action is at best the qualified Brahma. And the path leading to complete liberation, unconditional liberation, is the path of knowledge alone. So, not only different methods apply to these two paths, but also different results and criteria for those results. So, for example, on the path of action, which is promoted very strongly by Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, because after all, Arjuna is a king. He's a fighter, a warrior, a man of action. He's not a contemplative. And even though he tries to resign his position in the beginning of the Gita, Krishna stops it, says, no, 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 you don't want to do that. That's against Dharma. Why? You can't jump up. You have to complete the lower levels. Uh, it's just like a video game. <laughs> you have to complete the lower levels before you get to the main boss. <laughs> so life is like that in so many ways. Huh? Playing a musical instrument, athletics, or anything that requires skill and uh, physical training. You have to pass the lower levels. They have to become so ingrained in your being that you can perform those functions without even thinking about it, effortlessly, perfectly, every time. That's professional level of skill in any field. That it becomes so integrated with your being, it's no longer an act of will. It's simply a habit and it just goes on, and you're just the witness. That's a wonderful state. We call it flow. So this state of flow in terms of spiritual activities means internalizing the ritualistic sacrifices of the external 
practice of religion and also the practice of yoga and Sankhya philosophy into an attitude that we call bhakti, which translates roughly as love of God. So when karma yoga is mature, it automatically transforms into bhakti. Why? Love is developed by hearing about the exalted qualities of the beloved. So by hearing again and again during these Vedic rituals with, with chants and mantras and ceremonies and offerings and all this stuff, which are action, one slowly develops this attitude towards God of giving. Huh? And what is love? but service to the beloved, giving. So that's why the Vedic rituals are centered around giving things to God and hearing about God's glories through the mantras. And all the mantras begin and end with Aum. Aum is the symbol given in the Upanishads for Brahman. So in the back of your mind, well, in the front of your mind, you're thinking about the deity, the Godhead, the uh, personality of God. In the back of your mind, you're contemplating on Aum. This is a mystery. What is this? And uh, what Aum means cannot be thought, cannot be spoken, because it's transcendental. It's transcendental, that means it's beyond words. It's beyond all relationships. It's non-relational. It's non-inferable, says the Upanishads. You can't imagine what it's like. <laughs> you can't think your way to Brahman. You can only recognize that you are Brahman. And at this stage, the desire to participate further in the illusory material existence goes away. <laughs> Why should I invest in a game where, which ends in defeat? Hmm? Let's suppose you go to an investment counselor and he advises, oh, you should buy shares in this, you know, ETF or something. And, uh, the terms are you put your money in and at some random date, it all disappears. <laughs> it's gone. Zero. Well, what kind of investment is that? It might give some temporary profits, but in the end, you lose everything. Well, isn't that material existence? You work so hard, you suffer. And then at the end, you die. That's a bad deal. So my Adi Guru used to say, make the best use of a bad bargain. Like, yeah, material life is a bad deal, but get the best out of it, which is self-realization. Then you can let go of the body without any regrets and go on to a wonderful afterlife in a higher world or in Brahman itself. So the path to Brahman is different, categorically different from the path to the conditioned Brahman or what to speak of the heavenly planets and like that. The path to conditioned Brahman is the path of karma yoga and bhakti yoga. The path to the unconditioned Brahman is the path of meditation and realization. That's why the Smriti says, one who dies during the smoke, the night, and the passage of the sun in the southern hemisphere, they don't go to Brahma. They don't attain moksha. Because this applies to the followers of the external religious activities, those who still think themselves to be the doer. And 
because the doer is the one who becomes subject to karma or the results from his actions. He has to be born again to accept those results, good or bad, doesn't matter. That's why merit is also considered a trap. Because let's say, you know, you get all the merit you can. You perform the ashvameda sacrifice three times or, you know, some incredibly inconceivable, wonderful, pious activity. But what do you get from that? Another body. And yes, that body can be ultimately in the Brahma Loka. You know, if, if that's your goal, if that's your conception. But more likely you're going to wind up in one of the heavenly planets, enjoying like anything, partying like crazy, <laughs> until they run out. Your good karma, your results from your good activities are exhausted. Then you have to come back to planet Earth. Yuck. This is a slum. This is a ghetto, huh? This is the wrong side of the tracks of the universe. <laughs> it's a bad neighborhood, man. So what do we really want is moksha, at least to the planets of the conditioned Brahman, because those planets remain undisturbed until the end of the universe, and we have plenty of time to realize the unconditioned Brahman. When we do, let's say, uh, if someone is so fortunate that they realize the unconditioned, even in this life, huh, which Buddha called Nibbana or Nirvana, then they can go directly to Brahman because Brahman is everywhere and in everything. I mean, Brahman is everything. Brahman is existence itself. Sat. And it's consciousness, chit. So it is also ananda or bliss. Any happiness, any enjoyment, huh? any beauty there is in this world is only Brahman. And it's existence and consciousness. So you, know, you can't get away from Brahman. Brahman is there even in the darkest night, you know, uh, the North Pole. <laughs> Or something, you know, it's like everywhere, in everything, unconditionally. So if you attain the unconditional release, doesn't matter when you leave the body. Doesn't matter any physical activity at all. No longer has any impact, any effect on you. You're free from karma. You're free from cause and effect. You're even free from the laws of the scriptures. But those who follow the path of action have to abide by those laws because that is their means of liberation. See, in the conditioned realm. Now, Brahman is also in the conditioned realm and you can attain the planet of Brahman and live happily ever after. That's very nice. We're not saying there's anything wrong with it. But it comes under a different set of laws, conditions, than the release that you get by realizing the unconditioned Brahman, which is not subject to any laws or restrictions whatsoever, because Brahman is not subject to any restrictions. Brahman is unlimited, boundless, infinite. And that is the ultimate goal of self-realization. Now, this is the conclusion of Pada 2 of the fourth chapter of Brahma Sutra. After this, the path to Brahman will be discussed in more detail. He's only got up to the departure from the body. Huh? And in the next Pada, then we'll go farther. But I'm going to have to take a break because we have a big festival coming up and I have to devote all my energies to that for the next couple of weeks at least. So 
We'll see you on the other side. And if I get a chance, I will post some short videos, especially if you ask some interesting questions. You know, get involved. You can help direct the course of this channel by asking good questions. So, until then. Om Tat Sat Om Shakti Om Om Namah Shivaya